And so our first panel discussion is toward an ecological culture. Um, our first speaker, I think she messaged us that she won't be able to put on her video. I understand this very clearly. I'm a mother myself, and I think as a mother, I think she has her kid with her wonderful, um, but maybe she can still deliver her speech and we'll just listen um, to the audio presentation on urban ecological lifestyles and promoting systemic change. No? Our um, first speaker for this morning's panel is Dr. Kendra Gotanko Gonzalez. She's Associate Professor of the Department of Environmental Science at Ateneo de Manila, and she's Program Manager of the Climate Change and Disaster Risk of um, Ateneo Institute of Sustainability. At the same time, she's chairperson of a depart department and a mother. I don't know how she balances it all, but ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome in our own fashion, in our own homes, to our first speaker for this panel, Dr. Kendra Gotanko Gonzalez. Kendra, you have the floor. Good morning. Today's presentation is on urban ecological lifestyles. Specifically, I use systems thinking tools to gain insight on this topic. Now, it has often happened that you have scientists and researchers, advocates and policymakers thinking that if we could just communicate the science of the issue to other individuals in society, then they should be able to make better decisions and change their behaviors accordingly. This reflects the deficit model of communication. Now, the problem is, what if they don't change behaviors, or at least not in the way that we would expect? Does it mean that they're lazy or scientifically illiterate? Does it mean they're stubborn? It's very easy to label them as not caring, or perhaps just not caring enough to be inconvenienced by the extra time, effort, and cost it would take to implement the ecological alternatives. Now, you'll often hear in response to these allegations that, for example, I segregate, but I see the trash bits together when they're collected, so what's the point? Or, I would like to ride public transportation, but it takes two hours to get to work. Whereas if I drive by car, it'll only take 30 minutes. I can't afford to waste so much time. Or I would like to buy organic food, but these items at the supermarket are priced more expensively and my budget is limited. Are these valid arguments? Can we fault people for thinking along these lines? So individuals may be willing to transition to more ecological lifestyles but the urban support structures may be lacking or insufficient. So if we want mass adoption of eco-friendly lifestyles, then we need systemic change. What do I mean by that? This is the iceberg framework. We use it in systems thinking to connect the roots of the problem, which are largely unseen, to the events that we do see. So the events are the observable things. And if you take them together, they form patterns. And these patterns are driven by underlying structures. Structures could be institutions, laws and policies, financing mechanisms, and so on. Now, these structures are also underpinned by mental models. In other words, our worldviews or perspectives. Now, let's take an example. Say that the event that we notice is that your friends are buying cars. And looking at the pattern, we might find out that over the past year, sales by car manufacturers have at least held steady, if not increased. And this is despite the ubiquitous calls for reducing fossil fuel use by the transport industry. So why is that so? Well, let's take a look at the structures that enable that sort of pattern. Just browsing through the newspaper, you'll see these ads for financing mechanisms that make it easy to own a car. Keeping the car is something else, but at least to own it 
out, right? You have of the you have these all in low down payment schemes. Couple that with the transport infrastructure that's biased towards private vehicle use with not enough infra for public mass transportation. Now, if we dig deeper to the mental model, to the philosophies behind this, is there a philosophy in the way that we plan our cities, in the way that we uh, allot our zones? You notice that we have residential zones that may be located far from our commercial and industrial areas. So we really need to find a way to get to and from our home and where we work. Then maybe even more deeper than that, there's the cultural aspect. In the Philippines, owning a car is often a symbol of success. It says that you've made it in some way. So with that, what does this mean if we want to convince people to adapt a carless lifestyle? So going back to this, no matter how good the messaging to avoid using cars because they use fossil fuels and contribute to carbon emissions that lead to climate change, no matter how good that messaging is. It will not be efficient in changing behavior if we're only targeting individual choice. These messages okay, need to be coupled with support for infrastructure to enable mass transportation to reduce the need to travel long distances between where we live and where we work. And we also need to re-examine the cultural aspect of car ownership being a symbol of success. In other words, we need to dig deeper to investigate the social, cultural, technological, economic, as well as environmental factors that contribute, contribute to behavioral development. Now, this may seem to be common sense to some of you, but if you just take a look at the different schemes we've had to reduce private vehicle use on EDSA, for example, they're, they're pretty much all tantamount to saying, don't use your car, or at least don't use your car on EDSA. And what happens? People who have the means just buy another car with a different plate number, so they have something to bring out every day, or people still bring out their cars, but just use other roads. So the traffic is displaced elsewhere, say to C5. And why does that happen? It's really a lack of viable alternatives. So we need more of schemes to encourage mass transportation. And these schemes need to be convenient, safe, and accessible. Because who would want to ride the LRT if it's always breaking down or your pack like sardines? Those who have the means will just use their private cars anyway. We need to consider other modes of urban planning. Perhaps we look into the idea of townships so that you can walk or bike more easily from where you live to where you work. And deeper than that, we can look into changing the cultural aspect. A developed country is not a place where the poor have cars, it's where the rich use public transportation. So can we change the view that public transport is pangmasa while cars are pangmayaman and we should all aspire to therefore have cars? So that's a sample application of the iceberg framework to a mobility issue. We can apply it as well to other issues. For example, plastics in the food industry. We observe that microplastics are now showing up in uh, marine life, for example, and there's a lot of plastic waste being generated. What is the deeper reason for this? Does it come from a culture of convenience? Why are plastics the go-to and easily acceptable packaging method? Does it come from a sense of having just a hurried pace of life that we can't afford to sit down and have a slow cooked home cooked meal? And now in the time of pandemic, are there safety considerations as well? Another example, the problem of e-waste from gadgets. From the consumer side, 
Is it stemming from a culture of social status and needing to keep up with that? Or again, is it stemming from the hurried pace of life that we need to have gadgets that can not just, you know, message and call, but teleconference, edit documents and so on while we're on the go? From the side of the manufacturers, is it coming from a culture of planned obsolescence? Right. Is their design thinking not oriented towards repair and recycle? In other countries, for example, in the US, it's even an issue whether or not consumers should have the right to repair their own gadgets. Okay? Or do they have to take them to the original manufacturer? Another tool that we can use is that of the system archetype, success to the successful. Archetypes refer to commonly found system structures. And in this case, we have two competing entities, A and B. A initially enjoyed some success, but because of that, more of these finite resources are allocated to A rather than to B. So A continues to enjoy success, while B doesn't have the chance to because he's not getting those resources. Or a viable option as well. How do we apply that to this aspect? We can look again at the example of the use of private vehicles and our dependence on them. We have two pathways of development. The city becoming designed such that it assumes private vehicle use or your city designed so that it promotes active and public transport. Somewhere in our history, we started out with this, with a private vehicle use, and it created a reinforcing loop. So because the structure is for private vehicle use, People buy cars, and the more people buy cars, the more infrastructure is made to accommodate those cars, rather than channeling those resources into developing more of active and public transport. And because these things represent huge investments, you have a lock-in effect. It's not like you build roads and then you can take them down easily, right? So this sort of infrastructure is will be in place for the next de several decades. So it's going to require massive and expensive changes, not just in infrastructure, but also in incentive systems and culture in general to switch if we don't somehow break this cycle. So what are the opportunities if we recognize that we're caught in this sort of loop? The first is investigate historical origins. So why have our cities been flourishing in this way? Let's evaluate the current incentive and measurement systems. Are they somehow set up to favor one over the other? Again, we can also map our assumptions of success. Again, is it successful if you own a car? Is a city successful if it has infrastructure for cars? And then assess opportunities for innovation, experimentation that will help develop and lead to new alternatives. And going a step further, let's take those new alternatives and find ways to mainstream them so that they become the default. Now I'd like to share with you this study from researchers from IASA, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. They develop an agent-based model to study the evolution of sustainable behaviors. They, are, they were interested in studying how collective behavior patterns emerged uh, as part of personal, social, and environmental factors. And they tested this research against the evolution of cycling as the, now the dominant mode of transport in Copenhagen. And they use the concept of affordances. So affordances are opportunities available in the environment we live in that enable individuals to practice 
ecological behavior or to practice sustainable uh, behavior. So in the case of cycling, affordances will be in the form of cycling infrastructure. So let's say bike lanes. And they notice that the system produced a tipping point or a transition phase when the fraction of pro-environmental affordances reached 50%. So in other words, it's just as likely for you to choose the pro-environmental option rather than the non-environmental option. So beyond the 50%, okay, it means that in terms of infrastructure, it's the pro-environmental option that has become more probable. So in this study, they show that it's clear that they have to start designing our everyday environments in ways to make the sustainable behavior the default option, to be the one that's as easy as possible, and that the pro-environmental infrastructure should represent the paths of least resistance. And it's crucial for government action plans for sustainable future urban planning and development to take this into consideration. So personal choice and motivation are still important. Okay. That's a crucial point to make. If this is not about you know, stopping with the messaging to people about the strength of their individual choice, but it's about supporting that individual choice with the infrastructure to make it the easy choice. So practicing urban ecological lifestyle should not be inconvenient. It should be the norm. But to make that happen, we do need systemic change. So changes in infrastructure and changes in our underlying worldviews. So we need to identify which structures can act as affordances okay, to produce opportunities to reach tipping points towards pro-environmental behaviors. And underpinning all of this, we have to cultivate the ecological mindset. So this can provide the greatest leverage to shift alternatives into defaults. So if you're interested to learn more, uh, these are other references that I'll be happy to share with you. Thank you and good morning. So ladies and gentlemen, we've just seen a pre-recorded presentation of Dr. Um, Kendra. And now we will call on our next panelist. But before I introduce her, I'd just like to remind everybody the chat box is there. If you have a question for any of our panelists, just type away and um, we'll have a Q&A after everybody has presented. The second speaker in this panel is Program Management Officer for Southeast Asia Circular, United Nations Environment Program. And she is currently working on reduction of marine plastics. And it's an initiative of the United Nations Environment Program and the Coordinating Body on the Sea of East Asia, or COBC, to inspire market-based solutions and help formulate policies to prevent marine plastic pollution. Our speaker is Ms. Maggie Lee. She has previously led the market transformation effort in Singapore for the World Wildlife Fund. And after several roles in research and development and technical affairs in the retail and fast moving consumer goods industry with moguls such as Eon, Nestle and PNG, Maggie has been keen on creating sustainable solutions for Asia. Maggie's research interests are primarily on NGO corporate relationships, sustainable commodity procurement, and ASEAN environmental governance. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause virtually to our second speaker, Maggie Lee. You have the floor, Maggie. Thank you so much, Nikki. And thank you so much, Dr. Kendra, for the great talk. I know you're listening and uh, this is a, a very tough talk to follow because uh, you've been actually very, very um, informative. And also your talk was very sobering in terms of all our lifestyles. Um, my presentation is much more centralized on plastics and marine litter. Um, as Nikki has um, mentioned, I do work in the, in the region and our uh, project covers uh, six countries in Southeast Asia, including the Philippines and where I am here in Thailand right now. 
Um, so as you know, and as, um, as also our, our chief mermaid has also mentioned, the oceans are actually uh, in dire need of our um, revolutionizing. We are actually dumping quite a lot of uh, things that shouldn't be in the oceans. And I know that many people would want to skip the straw or bring their own cups or bring their own bags for this particular reason. But there are much more to that because we know that there's a lot of practices and habits that are being considered but they may or may not be very useful in helping reducing marine litter. And so today I'd like to actually share with you some of our um, findings and share with you um, a little bit of a myth busting session. So first of all, um, we're demonizing plastics and we know that quite a lot of people are saying that I'm not gonna use single use plastics for the rest of my life. And we should actually advocate for some of my past employers as Nikki mentioned, like P&G and Nestle to stop using single use uh, plastic packaging, but is that really useful? So I must really correct the narrative here is that plastic is strong, it's lightweight, it's versatile, it's actually bendable in every way. It's great for actually customized um, packaging and it's very long lasting. That is actually almost like a blessing and a curse. We know that there are at least seven great groups of plastics now. Seven is others, meaning that all, all the ones that do not fall into the first six go into the seventh group. So what is plastic pollution? Why is something so good to use? Why is something that is just any material becoming such a bad pollution problem? Well, we know that, um, first of all, on the top right, we see a turtle. And uh, as we just heard that the turtle with a straw in the nose is actually a much watched video and everyone has heard of a, a, some sort of a marine animal or a seabird has been, um, has been dying of, um, of being stuck or having plastics in their stomachs, macro and microscopic plastics alike. And so we know that wildlife is under threat because of this. But there are many more reasons that plastics is actually harming the environment. For example, plastics is actually causing climate change. It's worsening this crisis that's been affecting every part of the world. And also we are, as human beings, also eating and breathing in plastics. So why do we use so much of plastics in the first place? Coming from the angle of a scientist from a private um, uh, manufacturer, it is actually a very good material to use, as I mentioned with the properties, and more so because they're very economical. They're very cheap. It's a penny per, per pound or per, per penny per kilogram. It's almost free. And we know that um, the reduction of, um, of this type of material requires a replacement of it. How else are we going to get our shampoos, our, our baby powder, our cosmetics? We, we mentioned lipstick earlier as a, as a, a personal care item. And so how, how else do we get the essentials? Okay, so that's actually um, a very big question that people are asking right now. Do we go for alternatives or do we actually go back to other models that we have used before in history? So how does plastic actually um, end up being ocean um, debris in the first place? We know that um, some people may think that we, uh, a lot of us who are less scrupulous may bring plastics to the beaches and leave that there, especially with cigarette butts. Many of us know now that cigarette butts are not made out of pure paper and they will not disintegrate in the environment. They also have plastic filters in them. And so we know that there's quite a lot of actual littering that's happening. But that's actually not the majority of how plastic ends up in the oceans. We know that quite a lot of um, plastics, about 80% of that, is actually leaked from land-based sources. Meaning that if you actually dropped a, a plastic bag somewhere in Thailand or the Philippines, drop it on the ground, it gets blown up and it gets um, blown in by the wind towards some corner and you, you don't see it again. But then comes the next flood. We know that last week there's a lot of rainfall in the Philippines. It happens in Thailand very often too. When it rains, it floods. And what happens to the flooded water is that it goes back eventually and slowly, almost too slowly, back into the waterways. And with the rest of the debris that's on the ground goes into the waterways as well. So this is how land-based sources get into the waterways. And that's also how from the waterways, all waterways lead to the ocean. And that's also how the marine debris becomes marine debris. It wasn't meant to be marine in the first place. And that's also why that even when we are all scrupulous and we all do not litter into the oceans, 
this type of leakage still happens very often, especially when you use a Tetra pack uh, to drink a beverage. That straw cover that's very lightweight and transparent usually gets blown off to somewhere. So it's always these little bits of, um, of unintended littering that happens. And quite a lot of this is also from waste management. And I'll talk about that in a second. What is actually causing this? As I mentioned, there's a lot of unintended um, leakages into the environment, but is that really it? We know that globally we're using a lot more plastics due to many reasons, especially with the population um, rapidly increasing and also how uh, many countries are also becoming richer and richer, whereas um, it's very bipolar, but then we know that the rich are much able to actually afford more things in life. And we now actually have a problem with waste management, especially with metropolitans like Manila and Bangkok. We know that even though many years back, there were infrastructure that was built for the city far, far out in the countryside that's close to the city, but not quite. The cities have expanded so that these infrastructure are now in the middle of the city, so to speak. And we now know that there's quite a few reasons that contribute to the mismanagement of waste. First of all, we know that infrastructure is not catching up as fast as population growth in these metropolitans. It's not all natural population growth. As you know, many people are moving in for the extra um, employment opportunities that are offered here compared with elsewhere. And collection methods is also one thing. As people are now crowding into a already crowded area, collection is a very big problem. These um, collection trucks or vehicles cannot access some of these places. And therefore, the people can only resort to dumping at, um, at places that they're not supposed to dump. And also the, the lack of markets for secondary materials. We know that when trash is not segregated, it becomes a lump of contaminated waste. Um, even though when a lot of that um, components of those may be reusable and recyclable plastic, it's all contaminated. And therefore it's very difficult for recyclers to find anything that's worthwhile for them to recycle into the next bit of recycled material. So why isn't waste management capable of getting rid of that? There's many reasons for that as well. We know that policy is also having a tough time catching up with what's going on right now. As I mentioned, infrastructure is also the key. The system itself is being now overhauled to a point that many of these cities are now relying very much, even more so than formal um, waste management, but on informal waste pickers. This is also something that's very much the case for most of Southeast Asia, with the exception of one or two states. And even when infrastructure is in place and it's um, it's enough, people don't necessarily dispose or um, or or leave recyclable material properly, because there's actually a very tough time for people to wash and dispose of these in the right bins because of accessibility reasons, because of time reasons, and also because of education as well. And also later on, consumption continues to rise. Um, the amount of hair products and facial products that each one of us use is very, very different from the type of um, products that our parents or our grandparents used before. But waste management has not drastically increased since then. And therefore, it's actually still playing that catch up game. So a lot of people have suggested different ways to deal with the waste that's been accumulating, especially the plastic waste. Waste to energy is one of the few options that we can look at from a macroscopic angle. Um, we know that Japan has been looking at this for a very long time and they've had um, good success in actually using waste as, uh, as fuel for generating heat, which actually becomes electricity when the steam turns a turbine. However, we know that there is a lot of um, a lot of concerns about, for example, the um, the emissions of gases, emissions of microparticles that may actually harm health and also the environment. We know that there's a lot of technological um, investigation required before this becomes a general practice. But we know that instead of waste lying around and polluting the environment, this is definitely an option that we should look at. So what can we all do as people and as organizations, as universities, as aspiring business owners? We know that the problem is getting worse because um, first of all, there is a lack of incentive for any of the sectors to take the initiative and to take charge in terms of leading the way.
The government is actually um, trying to come up with, the governments are coming up with policies, but as I mentioned that um, the private sector is growing much faster than that and populations are growing much faster than that. And there are so, much, so many more things like e-commerce coming into play that is actually not in the jurisdiction of um, certain um, long lasting policies. We know that retailers, for example, supermarkets, are having a tough time delivering smaller and smaller packages to families that are smaller and smaller in size in these metropolitan places. So that's also why plastic is actually a much, much needed packaging for these type of packages or these types of products to reach us. Manufacturers as well, they're not having the incentive because their products are still selling very well. Coming from experience, we know that these manufacturers unless they're actually dictated by policy, will not choose to actually actively find more expensive ways to package their, um, their products unless it's something mandated. Ultimately, customers and NGOs like ourselves will need to actually voice out our need for plastics to be controlled and to be less um, of our obsession in, in, in our purchasing patterns. So this is a finger pointing game that stops with someone making the first initiative. And I call to you as consumers and its organizations, NGOs and whatnot, to make the first step by asking for this. If there is demand for us from the manufacturers, they will start creating products that look into more sustainable packaging. And by then the governments will know that this is not a huge impact on the economies and that, that's why they will be able to actually make more tough decisions on these manufacturers and also on waste management to accommodate. And then the retailers will follow suit because manufacturers have already done so. So going from a take, make, dispose, which is a very linear pattern. We take resources from the planet, we make products out of them, and then we use them and dispose of them. And then they are somehow thrown away. Well, there is really no away because this earth is a very close system. We know that there is no such thing as a way. In 2018, China has been the first country to, set, to say no to an importing waste plastics from other regions. And then the Philippines and then Malaysia. We know that recycling has lost its charm and it's almost like a, a myth that's busted at this point. But I must reassure you that recycling itself as a technology must continue. We can still propel this cycle on the right side of this slide in blue which is actually dictated as the circular economy that we're trying to thrive for, can still actually happen through the help of us. We need to actually re realize that there's no such thing as disposal and that all the material that we're using can actually be recycled, especially for recyclable plastics. We should, uh, we should also urge our favorite uh, manufacturers so that they do make products out of first recyclable packaging and then recycled packaging so that there's a demand for this market and that there's a, a value in recyclers going through the process. This market is um, totally reliant on how well we choose products. Next time we go to supermarkets, we can actually choose products that are already made out of recycled content. If we can't find them, we can go for the next best, which means that these products are now labeled with recyclable content. They're still new, they're still actually in the take, make and dispose pattern. But if we do um, sort them and put them into our their proper recycling bins, there's a chance that they will get back into recycling. So achieving circularity, as I just mentioned, uh, is on us and that we have to limit the use of new materials, use re recycled material so that the cycle keeps going on and on and on. And that we must always be, be mindful that plastic is not indefinitely recyclable. Some virgin material might still be also needed, but that we need, we need to do our best in re returning this material so that it goes back into the channels. So what happened with recycling? As I mentioned, um, it's actually a very strenuous process. It's not just that um, we collect all these items and then we cut them up and then they can all go back into uh, manufacturing again. It's actually labor intensive and energy intensive, especially with logistics. We now know that it's much less um, profitable and that's also why we, need, we can do our part in terms of um, carrying the weight of that process by segregating and by cleaning the material so that they don't get contaminated by the rest of the waste stream. As I mentioned, Southeast Asia is no longer um, importing plastic waste. There's also one big problem with that is because 
crude oil prices have sunk into record-breaking lows after COVID-19 hit. We've heard of negative oil prices, which means that it takes more money to store this crude oil in the warehouses than to actually buy them. That's also why um, crude oil um, owners would want to turn these raw materials into the next um, byproducts or final products, which may be plastics. And that's also why there's actually a spike of plastic production instead of a decrease, even in 2020. So ultimately, there are many questions about why can't we just ban plastics? Like in many places in the world, we've heard that plastics have been taken out of the system and that they're no, no longer using single use plastics like plastic bags or straws. Well. Um, to ban plastics is one way, but remember the need of us using those items will still be there unless there is a big culture shift for us. So instead of plastic bags, we will simply move on to other types of bags like paper bags or um, reusable bags. If we don't keep carrying those reusable bags, you may have heard that each cotton bag needs uh, is actually equivalent to the environmental impact of a few hundred plastic bags. And so that's why if unless we change our habits, even when we ban plastics, this, the environmental burden will simply migrate onto other forms of materials. Imagine if all of those were paper, what will happen to our forests if we actually only use paper instead of plastics? The problem will not go away by itself. It will just be another environmental problem. And therefore, the one planet culture shift must be in place for all of us consumers and organizations. We've looked at other materials such as paper as well. What about things like bamboo or cassava? We know that there's a, there are many new innovations. You hear about them almost every month. Some sort of an edible seaweed containing, um, containing water for marathon runners, for example. There are many good news um, of these innovations coming through. But I must also remind you that whenever we, we hear of an edible starch or some sort of a, a cookie cup for, for coffee, these are made out of food products and they will compete with the already tight agricultural um, resources. We, we are now requiring more land to grow our food and food for our food, which are livestock that are being eaten. So instead of actually burdening that further and creating more disposable items using these edible items, we're not urging for that as UNEP, we're urging for sustainably sourced um, natural materials, such as fibers from things that we no longer need. Sugarcane is one of the ones that already has a certification for um, sustainable sourcing. Um, we don't recommend using virgin paper. Recycled paper is much better an option. And what about beach cleanups? Many of us may have participated in some sort of a beach cleanup or a waterways cleanup. They're a lot of fun and they're very educational to students and to, to young people alike. Um, I'd like to use this analogy to, to explain why beach cleanups may only be a very short term solution. Is that when you go into a bathroom and you see the bathtub overflowing, the first thing you do is usually to turn off the bathtub's tap. You don't go grab the mop right away. So beach cleanups are the equivalent of mopping the floor when the floor is already wet, but the bathtub is still overflowing. It will actually dry off the, the ground a little bit for that brief moment of time, but it won't be the ultimate solution. Whereas beach cleanups are also very helpful in one way is that there's a good way of recovering waste plastics that are recyclable. We are advocating for the standardized beach cleanups or any type of recovery from nature of plastic waste. They could be very beneficial in terms of um, corporations attaining plastic neutrality, but in general, beach cleanups by themselves will not do the trick. So to explain um, what we're doing in Southeast Asia, I'd like to take one minute to, to talk about our project, which is called Sea Circular. Um, so inheriting the, the play on words from Anna, we're also a play on words. Sea means sea, of course, um, like oceans, but also it means Southeast Asia. And circular, it um, obviously implies to circular economy, like the blue circle that I've already talked about. Sea Circular is wholly funded by the Swedish government, and it's run within the UNEP um, uh, office here in Bangkok. It is um, a project that is ongoing and the approach is actually to look at four outputs. We're looking into influencing the markets, talking to businesses and making sure that the private sector understands which solutions are good and which solutions are maybe false messiahs for these um, types of problems. 
Second output is actually to link with the different governments, the Philippine government included. These six countries that were involved in Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam and Cambodia are the six countries that are in our target list. We're using science-based mechanisms to influence these governments for marine uh, debris tracking and monitoring purposes. We also do outreach. This is one of the things that I'm doing right now is that we're talking with universities. We're, talk we're linking up with different um, educational institutions so that we actually de deliver um, the right messages about marine litter and also about their solutions to different entities. And at last but not least, we really need regional networking. If the Philippines or if Thailand works alone, it's actually good for only the vicinity of this country. But as we know that, for example, like the Philippines, it is an island country. There is really no land borders with any other country. It's the oceans that is actually connecting all of us. And therefore, we require regional, um, re regional collaboration and solutions for us to tackle a problem that is regional. Marine litter knows no bounds. They will only travel amongst all these different countries that share the seas. And that's also why the COP Sea Mechanism, which is the coordinating body on the seas of, South, uh, of East Asia, is now very much involved in connecting these countries that could have solutions for one another too. We do have a five-step approach for businesses so that they understand their footprint. Much like carbon footprint, plastic can also be calculated and can be controlled. This is actually a very um, long process. We don't expect companies to adopt this uh, overnight, but we are urging companies from all over Southeast Asia, including the Philippines, to go on to embark on this free journey that's provided by UNEP for them. And that eventually we hope that they can also declare plastic neutral. Um, this is a very um, busy slide, but just to let you know what we're doing across um, Southeast Asia and also in different uh, countries in the area. This concludes my presentation. If you have any questions or any comments, please feel free to find me and also to message the project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maggie. My gosh, that was a busy presentation that was like a roller coaster ride with the bad news and the good news rolled up into one. Um, it's always good, you know, uh, to have metaphors. And this is the powerful metaphor I'm taking away with me today of turning off the faucet because I get excited sometimes with cleaning with the mop while the faucet is still going on. Oh my gosh. Okay. So Maggie is really very pretty and she speaks in a very authoritative manner. So it reminds me of watching the news and how the good news and the bad news are all there together. You'd give us something that will give us hope then say, wait, but that's not enough. And there's a problem with that too. And you're the first presenter I've heard who talks about the good in plastic, which is not the way I wanted to start. Um, we'll have, we have some questions already, but we will have our Q&A after we finish all the panelists from speaking. So Maggie, we'll get back to you later. And um, I'm collating the, the we, you've generated some chatter uh, from the audience and I'll just collate them later and then throw them at you. So, but for now, I'll introduce the next speaker in the panel. So we'll get back to you later, Maggie. Thank you very much for that presentation. A big round of applause from us, from our homes in, in digital fashion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maggie. Okay, so I'll introduce our next speaker. He's my teacher. Um, our next speaker is, um, okay, we'll do a little bit of a gender balance today because we've had three women speakers, one after the other. So we're going to have now our first male speaker. Uh, oh no, we had the welcome remarks and opening remarks from male. So now we have a gender balance of three women and three uh, men speaking this morning. We'll start with um, Father Albert Alejo as our first panelist. He's Paringbert, that is how he wants to be called. He is the chair of the board of the Sacred Springs Dialogue Institute of Spirituality and Sustainability of the Loyola Schools of Theology in Ateneo de Manila University. He was my teacher in integral ecology. He finished his PhD in social anthropology in the School of Oriental and African Studies in the University of London. He also has an MA in social anthropology and um, um, he uh, is an Asian um, public intellectual. She had an Asian Leadership Fellowship Program. He's known for many things in the Philippines. He is multi-talented. He writes poetry, translates. He's an author of books, but he also 
has performance qualities and he's also an urban farmer. When you follow his Facebook feed, there are just so many things there to mention. Uh, but today, um, uh, he's uh, going to talk about cultural energy hmm. as a resource of integral ecology. Farling Bert, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, cultural energy as resource for integral ecology. Well, how can you follow those two great <laughs> women presenters? Huh? Anyway, this is not a competition, but a cooperation. <laughs> and we're not interested in power as domination or resistance, but energy. Now, <clears throat> the UN says cultures are enablers in sustainable development. The UN pledges to acknowledge natural and cultural uh, diversity because cultures and civilizations can contribute to and are crucial enablers of sustainable development, including integral ecology. But I must say, this is something new. <laughs> so many things are being done, but this is new in terms of uh, acknowledging that local cultures can also be partners of scientists and economists and engineers. And then uh, communities could also become partners of institutions. Remember, after the war devastation, the US President Truman says, uh, people need progress through knowledge. Poor guys, they're very poor and they're victims of disease. Poverty is a handicap to them. And if they migrate to our rich countries, there will be a threat. So thank God, history, uh, humanity, you know, humanity <laughs> possess, possesses the knowledge and the skill to relieve their suffering. And uh, what kind of knowledge is that? According to this uh, UN, according to Ruman, Truman, what we envisage is a program of development. So it's not just a development, but programmatic development. What is the key to that? Greater production is the, the key to prosperity and peace. And the key to greater production is the application of modern scientific and technical uh, knowledge. Remember, it's a product of uh, enlightenment. Now, that was 1949. And two years after that, the UN Social and Economic Affairs echoed it, uh, but with more power. Instead of just development, it mentions economic progress and not just economic progress, but rapid economic progress. And sorry, this rapid economic progress is impossible without painful adjustments. And what happens to that? Sorry, ancient philosophies will have to be scrapped. Old social institutions will have to disintegrate because we are replanning the whole thing. Bonds of cars and race have to burst and sorry, very few communities will enjoy this rapid economic progress. So, sorry na lang. <laughs> so what was the result? Unsustainable development, inequality, and disasters. So the Pope is saying, together with other NGOs, given the complexity of the ecological crisis and its multiple causes, we need to realize that the solutions will not emerge from just the physical scientists, natural scientists, not just the mystics, but we need to consult all the different ways of interpreting and transforming reality. So respect must also be shown for the various cultural riches of different peoples. Uh, at a certain point, when they introduced plastic, it was the savior of the world. <laughs> Now their art and poetry, their interior life and spirituality will have to be included. So far, poetry, spirituality, local communities have not really been uh, mentioned so far. No? Even, even uh, no, uh, mystical poetry. Um, <clears throat> that's why I translated uh, Brother San Sister Moon of uh, Francis of Assisi into Tagalog. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm not... I'm not yet selling the poster. <clears throat> so in my book, Generating Energies, I introduced the word uh, cultural energies. It's energy from within. Energies are also power, but power not so much as domination, power over as domination, 
uh, but power from within. Um, tension arises when in the process of one form of power, other human uh, energies are sacrificed. But take note, sometimes the very process of suppressing people's participation could re you know, result in new transformation of identities, new ways of moving the body, new ways of organizing space. We need the imagine ocean. <laughs> uh, out of the hiddenness of the minute acts of daily practices, cultural energies are generated. Um, most philosophers would use constructed and deconstructed, but I prefer energies, uh, the energization and the generation. Um, unexpected creativity arises from the point where one would think subjugated people would have been crushed. I remember I was riding a tricycle in southern Mindanao and I saw the devastation of the environment. I told the driver of the tricycle, I said, shame on the people, they destroy the environment. And the driver of the tricycle said, Yes, sir, that's true. The people, human beings destroy the environment. But don't worry, sir. It's also human beings who will repair the environment. <laughs> and so unexpected creativity arises. You know, <clears throat> new forms of knowledge are released when the bodies uh, respond to gongs and songs. And with the movement of the body, you start movement of uh, a, a social movement. Maybe cleaning the beach might not solve everything, but you introduce a new way of moving the body by, introduce, by bringing in the, the kids out of the malls, but they're going into uh, the experience of this, the salt water and the wind and the sea. Then you generate new experiences which move the body in a different way. And therefore, the, the, the mind, the imagination would spark new ways of interpreting reality and new ways of reconstructing uh, possibilities. It's what you call finding the hope in the past possible future. <laughs> uh, this activates research of strength, knowledge, and imagination. And that is what you call cultural energy. And I, I stand as witness to these cultural energies employed in integral ecology. Uh, I've been to different tribes. For example, when I went to the Aka tribe in Thailand, I witnessed this swing festival, uh, especially uh, for the um, initiation of the, the young women. <laughs> but they note, what do they sing as they swing? Let there be, let there be good harvest. Shh. Let there be peace. Shh. Let there be communities. <laughs> And it bonds the community and uh, those who are away from the land, they come back and they see the problems, they help. And so you, you revive a community and that's how you, you produce energy from apparently just simple cultural uh, waste of time <laughs> and energy to a reorganization of a village uh, community. Beautiful. Now, uh, in my book, I, I stayed 18 months in Mount Apo, where the Philippine National Oil Company drilled four kilometers deep to generate steam from uh, geothermal energy. And that, was, that, you know, that caused uh, a stir because it was one of the few remaining rainforests in Southeast Asia, and it was an ancestral domain of the Obomanobo. Uh, what happened? Um, with the destruction of uh, the environment, some tribal leaders and elders and priests went to the hot sulfur spring and said sorry to the spirits. When they said sorry to the spirits, they organized their families. <laughs> and while the, the other political NGOs were trying to organize the communities by uh, ideological frameworks, this family organized their clan using the idiom of family uh, get together. And when they started 
convening the family, the clans, the elders, they said, how can, what are we going to do? We, we should dance. They asked me to borrow gongs and with the borrowed gongs, they danced. And when they danced, they moved their bodies. And then they said, uh, since our bodies have moved, we should now wear again the tribal costume. And how can we continue to dance if we don't own the land? And so they organized um, structurally and politically that finally they got the, the land, 4,000 hectares within the ancestral domain, uh, within the Mount Apo na Natural Park. It was a success politically, but uh, a political success for the participation in taking care of Mount Apo, the highest mountain in the Philippines, but passing through cultural community organizations and starting from the bodies responding to traditional music. Now, when I went to, um, to Jakarta, I witnessed the Duson Glandong. There was a problem of pollution to water and they, they, uh, they organized the, the community to uh, via the cultural uh, artists, the painters, and that moved the community together with the, the priestess and the older uh, women, and they managed to contain the, the project, okay? Especially with the leadership of the elder Eyang Tani to mobilize collective action. Beautiful, they used painting symbols and of course, uh, of course, rituals. Now in the Philippines, there is what you call Bayanihan, as a practice of cultural energy. It's a collective and an harmonious movement in changing your address. Unfortunately, you cannot do that for condominiums, <laughs> but it's a, it's a real, until now, I could see some of these things happening. And this spirit of collective action appears, uh, especially when there are typhoons and the floods and even war. Now it is being harnessed for eco-partnership uh, planting and now for facing uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So we, in order to call the people to, to collective action, they say the keyword, by any hand. Now in this sense, cultural energy is, uh, is a resource for resiliency. And uh, we hope that you know, people devastated by pandemic, by war, by um, floods, by volcanic eruption could bounce back, okay? <clears throat> now, so is resilience um, the new sustainability? Wait a minute, as the previous presenters would say, don't, don't romanticize no man, <laughs> these initiatives. Cultural energy as resistance, yes, but yes, don't re, don't uh, re, we should not romanticize cultural energy simply for resilience, because sometimes um, the government officials would say, "Oh, don't worry, we just smile away our misfortune, uh, we will bounce back, babound tayo. Don't worry, we are resilient uh, people." No. I think one challenge now is to harness cultural energy, not just for resilience, but also for resistance. We need to make use of these generated energies of enlivened communities to help to hold public officials accountable and to generate uh, auditing systems where the money goes. Why do we have 16 billion pesos for fighting 5,000 new people's army, whereas we have very few billions for disaster prevention. Now, um, therefore, cultural energy can be tapped also for resistance. I come from Obando, Bulacan, where we have this dancing, Santa Clara, you know, you know. and we have three patron saints. We have three patron saints uh, St. Clair, St. Pascual, the dancer, and Nuestra Señora de Salambao, the lady of the big fish net. And we have devotion to that. And every year we have dancing for in honor of the, the lady. Now, the problem is 
the government, the government, especially the local government, has this project of putting the garbage of Metro Manila in our fish ponds. The infamous uh, Smoky Mountain is just 12 hectares of landfill, a mountain of garbage. But their plan in our, in my municipality, was to put up this 44.4 hectares of garbage landfill to be dumped in our fish ponds. And we have, you know, the, our fish ponds are facing the Manila, uh, Manila Gulf. So what happens? The dancing, the fertility dance in honor of the lady of the big fish net becomes now a, a, a movement of resistance. So this dancing is conducted in front of the Supreme Court. <laughs> so we exported this cultural energy as resistance in the uh, official government structure. And the church is uh, part of the, the protest against it. So maybe aside from- uh, Having yes? yeah. One minute to wrap up if that's okay. Yes, one minute. Maybe the challenge is not just resilience, resistance, but also redesigning uh, different communities. And we could learn from other cultural communities like the Batanes architecture and landscape. Okay, so interior ecology demands participation of communities energized by their cultures. Maybe I should stop there. If we are truly concerned to develop an ecology capable of remedying the damage we have done, no branch of the sciences and no form of wisdom can be left out and that includes the religious. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paring Bert. I really miss listening to you because whenever you speak, there's always going to be some dancing and some music, you know. It's like everything you know is passed on through your body. It's embodied knowledge talaga and movement. Um, so what I'll do now is I'll read all the questions together at the same time, and then I'll just ask our panelists who are able to join us to respond collectively. So I'll just ask one time. I'll read the questions that we received, for example, from B. Manehar, he said, um, incineration is explicitly prohibited by Republic Act 9003 or Ecological Solid Waste Management Act and Clean Air Act. How can the Philippines compromise this contradiction if incineration is the future or something to be considered? Um, another question, microplastics along with fiber shed from synthetic fabrics are emerging pollutants being used in facial cleaners and cosmetics. They have also actually been detected in marine organisms, including commercial seafood and even in drinking water. Is this type of pollutant integrated in UNEP's programs related to pollution reduction or mitigation? I think that's addressed to Maggie, but since... Paring Bert was my teacher. I know we talk about this in class also. And there's also in the Philippines, there are rattans and bamboos, which can be used to make baskets. And these are durable and will last long. These can be substitutes for plastics. Um, Benny, Rab that, Benny Rabara says, that was from Benny Rabara, sorry. There are other comments, for example, uh, oh, um, our speaker, Dr. Kendra Gotanko Gonzalez says, thank you for the plastic stock, Maggie. I enjoy the system's approach to the issue. Um, and there. Okay, so uh, also um, the, there's a comment no, um, from June. Thank you to all the speakers for this session. There has been a common theme I have seen across these presentations, and that is the redefinition of development. While the traditional version has been about industrialization, production, and economic growth, there has been, been a movement to redefine it to include sustainable and environmental considerations. So how can people from the societal level promote this sort of understanding as a global norm? Okay, so I'll give the floor to Maggie first, maybe for a few minutes, and then um, Father Alejo. I hope you could just address the questions collectively. So Maggie? 
Thank you. And also, thank you so much for Fada Alejo's uh, talk. That was a very refreshing one, and uh, I think I much needed that. Um, and thank you so much for all the questions on YouTube and also um, through all the channels. Um, first of all, the incineration question. Um, in my opinion, my personal opinion, I don't think incineration is the way of future. It is actually the last resort. Hong Kong has also done that. My hometown of Hong Kong has also done that, meaning that um, we've banned incineration. But as you know, Hong Kong is a very tiny place and we've run out of places for landfills albeit a sanitary landfill that is very well controlled but um, it really requires a lot of effort and it is just merely um, displacing trash from your backyard to someone else's backyard because even if it's no one's backyard right now it is the it is the environment's backyard and so we really need to put this into good perspective because um, there has been a lot of less than scrupulous recyclers who have been moving um, post-consumer waste especially plastic waste in the name of recycling to places like the philippines and thailand and then they're just buried in the mountains in oblivion sometimes not even buried and so we've had a quite a lot of the exposés on these and that's also why um, I can understand that um, the President Duterte and also many leaders across Southeast Asia have been saying no to importing of plastic waste and so um, my best um, answer for for the replacement of incineration is that we really should actually um, put in more effort into actually upgrading the infrastructure for recycling so that the volumes and the technology can digest what's out now out there. And also at the same time, in parallel, we should ask for manufacturers to consider moving into recycled content first. So not a drastic change from, from a regular plastics, it's still re regular plastics, but of sometimes inferior quality in terms of printing and in terms of um, texture and all that. But uh, it is a necessary next step that we must make and it should be a synchronized step so that there is no uh, disadvantage for a second mover. Imagine if you go to a supermarket, you hold up two bottles of shampoo. I know most men just buy the shampoo, but then a lot of the women smell it, they look at the claims, they look at everything. Imagine if these two things are exactly equal, same price, same claims whatsoever, makes your hair very nice in the same ways, but one of them has a flimsy and ugly bottle. Would, would you buy that one if the same price? So that's also why our mentality needs to change first. We need to be prepared that our products are not going to be looking as pristine and as fabulous as they were once if we are actually ready to take this on. And that's also something that I'd like you to make as a commitment to yourself. So that's the first bit. And the second bit, I heard that there's like rattan and there's different types of natural fibers that are long lasting and are useful for, for this. Um, funny enough, in Thailand, right before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, broke out, in January, they banned all plastic bags for um, convenience stores and some of the supermarkets. It wasn't actually a, a regulatory ban. It was just more of a strong recommendation from the government and all the retailers follow suit. And so at that time, uh, Thailand had the biggest um, comic um, outbreak of people bringing in fish cages, crab cages, and bringing camping tents to hold their shopping. Anything but plastic bags. So um, they did use a lot of rattan baskets, which is really, uh, uh, from, from history of safe use, we know that rattan is very good and inert. And also um, our grandparents have been using that across Asia. And so why not bring them back for the exact same purposes? And so um, I believe those could be a, a good way to actually bring back something that's retro and old school. Um, and also um, that really um, actually is a very safe option for us. And with regarding microplastics, um, that is actually a very great question because um, we know that in Europe, they have already now uh, in place policies to ban micropla microplastic beads. Those are the ones that are used in face wash as exfoliants because they gently scratch the surface of the skin. And that's very close to home because I was a skincare um, cos cosmetic scientist at uh, uh, at Procter and Gamble. And so that is already being wiped out in certain parts of the world, whereas in Asia, there is still no law on that. But the good news, as uh, Nikki mentioned, I'm a, the, the harbinger of bad news and also the, the bringer of good news, is that um, the last ad hoc open-ended expert group on marine litter and microplastics, the fifth one actually, um, the fourth one actually was actually just um, on the 9th on, to the 13th of November, which was just days ago. Um, there were uh, quite a lot of uh, successes in terms of addressing these problems. And we are coming up with um, more guidelines on uh, what to do for, for the countries themselves. So that when countries are looking to 
ban microplastics or prevent microplastics from entering oceans, they will have a, a full story without having to actually devote that much more money into researches. So the idea is to actually make sure that the science is shared by all the countries across the United Nations, whereas the countries need to implement these policies. No one can actually go into another person's country to tell them what to do, including the United Nations, we can only strongly recommend. But hopefully, um, we're urging the ASEAN Secretariat to also um, continue to be engaged in these marine litter um, groups. And we also have very good um, uh, mechanisms within the COPC involving the Philippines and Thailand and the other uh, countries we mentioned, all nine in total. Um, if you draw an invisible line from South Korea all the way down to the end of the um, Indochina Peninsula, which is Singapore, you actually form this sea, East Seas border. And all the countries, including the archipelagos uh, of Indonesia and the Philippines are included in the COP C mechanism. And so therefore, um, there is a very strong initiative from the region that is already um, reflected by the Bangkok, de Bangkok Declaration from 2019 to tackle waste, um, uh, plastic waste in the marine systems. So hopefully we will, we will find ourselves to have new policies that regulate this, but for at the meantime, it's actually the exploration and, um, and the investigation stage. Thank you for your questions. Aaron Bert, there's a question specifically for you. Um, what is your take on IPRA espousing and protecting IP culture or in the in indigenous people's culture and traditional practices? Is the institution and policy effective and how does one go forward? That's a question for you from B. Manehar. <clears throat> well, um, I would like to make a distinction between the so-called primitive technology and the primordial, primordial spiritual relationship with the material universe. I think what we need to imbibe and absorb you know, together with the indigenous communities is the original spiritual relationship with the, with the earth. And they were creative in their own way. Now to, be, to, to, to say that we need to protect the indigenous peoples does not mean we should be fixated with their original or early uh, technological uh, source, uh, technological manifestations of their creativity. Human beings de develop. So what I'd like to say is, uh, num number one, <laughs> and this is, I'm saying this to myself also, uh, make sure that I touch the earth. And when I touch the earth, I allow the earth to speak to me, to communicate. Otherwise, I'll just, whether it's plastic or earth or mountain, I will just look at them as an economic resource. So have a de develop a, a different kind of relationship with the earth, with, with the sea, with, the, with, with water, with the insects, etc. And then listen to ordinary people, but also listen to scientists. <laughs> because they're also human beings. <laughs> uh, now, what about the NCIP and the IPRA? Well, these are institutions that also need conversion. The church also needs conversion. Uh, we need to change our mindset. Even uh, the Pope admits of the mistake in our catechesis when we promoted uh, go forth and multiply and subdue the earth, dominate the, the animals. And the Pope in the, his encyclical says, sorry, that was a wrong, <laughs> a wrong catechesis. So the church, together with other government institutions and even scientific institutions, they, we need all uh, conversion. That's why this movement for environment, ecology, needs ecological conversion of the heart. The, the garbage outside in society actually comes from the garbage of the heart. Thank you very much, Father Alejo. You know, um, there was a part of me that was thinking there are two different conversations going because there's a scientific language and your language. And then I realized, no, it's exactly having these two kinds of ways of speaking in the same room in the same conversation that is worth celebrating. You know, we started with an invocation on interconnectedness. And when you ended with that, the garbage in the heart reflects the garbage that is outside. We can see that these 
conversations really have to be done together. There's no use putting two different panels mm -hmm. where we only have the scientists talking and then the cultural people talk. You know, this is integral. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's really having everybody combined.